Let me briefly introduce uh, the three folks who will be leading this discussion. First, we're very delighted to have Jacob Reeder, the Acting De uh, Principal Deputy National Coordinator of the Office of National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at HHS, who will open with a presentation on health delivery reform and the future of health IT-enabled quality improvement. Again, very much on topic. Uh, then we'll hear from John Halamka, who's the CIO at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and he'll be speaking about healthcare IT innovations that are connecting patients, providers, and payers. And then finally, we'll hear from Sachin Jain, who's the Vice President and Chief Medical uh, for Chief Medical Information and Innovation at Merck and Company, and he'll be speaking about three distinct patients and how health information technology can enable the pharmaceutical industry to improve patient care. At that point, we'll get together and converge up here for the panel discussion on how we can really deploy HIT to enable innovation within the future state of healthcare. So with that, let me turn the podium over to Jacob Reeder. Each of these folks will present in turn, as I say, and then we'll gather up here for our panel discussion. Jacob, welcome. So this is what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, quality is important. Uh, usability is important, and why. Health IT has to change, and the focal point of health IT, and what, where we're aiming, is gonna shift from documents to data. Uh, and patients are gonna be in control, not providers. Uh, notice that I don't say when, I just say what. And I'll throw this slide up again at the end so you don't have to try and transcribe it now. Um, I, I see a couple quality geeks, at least one in the room, um, and I want to pause a little bit to, to think about quality. You know, when we talk about quality, um, it's not always clear what it is that we're talking about. Quality to me um, is different from quality to you. I, I'm happy to eat at Taco Bell and my wife won't even walk in. Um, because to me, the quality is not that important. Uh, quality of healthcare is different from quality of food, and quality to me might mean that I get uh, into the doctor's office quickly, and quality to you might mean the doctor's uh, bedside manner is important, and quality to somebody else means that the doctor um, has the lowest complication rate of anybody in town. Um, and yet we don't know what the doctor's complication rate is uh, if we don't have data on that doctor's performance. Um, and so often we measure what we see, we measure what we interact with, um, and, and yet if we don't have access to, to more meaningful information, it's often hard for us to measure ourselves and others uh, properly. And so this is quality measurement circa, oh, I don't know, um, 2013. Right, and so the way that quality measurement worked in many practices and certainly in hospitals is that folks were downstairs in the basement, I don't know if she's in the basement, um, and we would take paper records and we would create data by looking at the paper records, right? We would make a, a maybe a check, series of check boxes on a, on a piece of paper and we would look for the information for which the organization was uh, being measured. Um, so we would actually create data, and the questions would be, where will it be found? Um, so quality measures are really looking backwards, right? They're looking back in time, and the way that we would do quality measurements circa 2013, and I'm, you know I'm sort of mocking myself, um, the way that we would do quality measures is that uh, we would decide we would, something was important. So do all the patients in the emergency department get an aspirin? And we'd say, well, Let's look and see. And so we would tell somebody to go off into the medical records department. They would look for that information, and they would come back six months later, and they would say, no, they don't. Only 22% of them do. And then we would all gather in some conference room with coffee, and we would decide, here's what we're going to do to change that number from a 22 to a better number. And then we would implement this change, and then six months later, we would do it again, which means six months after that, we would get the data. And we'd say, wow, we've implemented a, a 
change and we're, all, we're up to 32%. And this is how things worked and we actually thought we were doing a good job. Um, and this is my kind of model for how this stuff could, would, should work, right? We do research uh, what's happening, so this is how we learn things, and, and Susan mentioned uh, that that is one of the things that we need to get to from here, uh, is that research is incredibly slow. I was a researcher once for about six months, and I didn't have the patience for, for being a researcher. Uh, we, we literally did the chart reviews and recruited patients, and I said, man, I am never going to be a researcher when I grew up. That's when I decided to go into health IT. Um, based on research, we decide what healthcare ought to look like, and we say, okay, here are the guidelines, uh, the clinical practice guidelines that say every patient in the emergency department uh, for whom it is not contraindicated should get an aspirin. Um, and then ideally, we do clinical decision support, right? We, we help the providers, and this is the piece that I would argue we've never gotten to, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but um, the key here is that when we do measurement, like I described earlier, or even if we do it circa 2014 with E-measures and clinical quality measures that tell us really quickly how we're doing, we're still giving the third graders a C plus on math, right? But we're not giving them calculators, we're not teaching them how to do it, we're not helping them get A's because ideally, shouldn't everyone get an A, right? This is healthcare and all of our patients deserve that all of the providers are perfect or as perfect as we can be. So shouldn't decision support say, hey, did the patient get an aspirin? And then if the provider or even the nurse or the, the, um, the orderly, as they used to be called, um, makes sure that the aspirin gets given. Right? So clinical decision support engages us at or near the point of care. And it doesn't even need to be the clinician. Right? And we're starting to see this, and I guess I'm, I'm uh, telegraphing my past. We're starting to see that as we move the information closer to the patient, what happens to the 50-year-old when they have a birthday? I had a, had a birthday last summer. And all of my friends from high school started posting something on their Facebook pages. Does anybody know what it was? their colonoscopy. So everybody takes pictures of their go lightly and, you know, here's what I'm drinking tonight, how about you? And it was funny that all of my high school friends were doing this about the same time. But that's because they knew that it was important. And sometimes we would then go to our physicians and say, this is what I need, right? And the doc says, oh, oh yeah, right, yes, definitely, I was going to suggest that. Um, so CDS is cons clinical decision support, it's also consumer decision support. And then quality measures, did it happen? Are we doing this properly? And you can look at it another way, right? Clinical research goes to evidence-based guideline, goes to CDS intervention, goes to health, care, and life. And ideally, we optimize the triple aim that, that uh, Susan described. Then we measure it and we say, hey, we're not doing so bad. And that actually goes into clinical research because sometimes we might be doing worse than we thought and we can change something through clinical research. So decision support's looking forward rather than quality measurement looking back. These are the things that should be happening rather than the things that were happening. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit to usability because I think that's an important part as we think about health information technology and its role in helping us provide optimal care. Um, we often hear critique of usability and uh, or critique of health IT products, right? Raise your hand if you've heard a clinician complain about the usability of a health IT product. <laughs> Everyone's hand should go up because by now, all of us have been in the room at some point in our lives with a clinician who has also been using health information technology. And I would argue that it's still, the usability is still uh, not where it needs to be. But usability is not Boolean, right? It is either, it's not usable or not. And this is a wonderful paradigm that I stole from a guy named Stephen Painter. Um, uh, a product can be functional, which means it does what it was intended to do. It can be, but not reliable. And I'll give you an example of that. It could be reliable, it does it every time. It can be usable, it anticipates my needs. It's convenient, it's easier to do it this way than another way. It's pleasurable. I derive pleasure from this. It's a good thing. It means it helps me take better care of my patients. I get to 
um, the Boston Seaport Hotel um, without getting confused in Boston traffic. Um, functional. The Model T came with a toolkit because it was not reliable. It was expected to break down. Reliable, it works that way every time, but if your friends have numbers that are eights or nines, it's really hard to call them. And that's why it was a good thing to have a number that had lots of low numbers in them back then. Usable, it's much easier and it doesn't matter where your numbers are. Ah, now we're getting uh, up into the pleasurable domain, right? Who has emotions about their iPhone? Right, we hear people express certain things about them. And I put this here to remind us that just because it's pleasurable doesn't mean that it's better. Um, and I, sometimes I put up the, um, the autocomplete, right, uh, damn you autocorrect auto uh, examples. Um, there was a wave that went through the, the blogosphere or the, the tweetosphere yesterday or the day before, and it was very funny. Um, when things are pleasurable, right, autocomplete in an iPhone is the, the current example, right? Often it's pleasurable, right? It anticipates my needs. I only type the first three letters and it finishes it for me and that's great. But maybe it's not safe because it finished, if it finishes the first, um, or the, if I type the first three letters of the drug and it gets it wrong and I kill you, then it's not safe. And this is my reminder. Now you'll always remember that I talked about safety because this little bugger is safe. Um, safety is an important component of usability. In fact, at ONC, we're focused on usability because it's safer. Now, we want all the clinicians to be happy and, and derive pleasure from, the, from their systems, um, but it's more important that they be safe. Um, this is safety. This is a barricade in a bicycle path, and what you don't see is on the right, there's a two-lane highway, and when you don't have one of these, the bikes go really fast and the trucks go fast too, and the trucks win. And so you put these in the way and you slow people down, and they're a little bit unhappy about it, but they're not dead. And so one of the critiques that clinicians will often say is, oh, it's too slow. Well, sometimes slower is better. And in fact, if you have a drop-down menu, and you're gonna amputate somebody's big toe and you say left, right, and you click, and 1% of the time you click on the wrong one just because the system was designed poorly, uh, that 1% is too many, right? Um, and so typing in L-E-F-T might be better in that scenario. So that's just a, a, an anecdote of a suggestion for how designers might want to think about slowing their users down sometimes, and that's not always a bad thing. Um, so now I'm going to sort of combine the two models, so we're talking about quality again, and this is what I would describe as the quality chasm 2.0. And so um, quality measures, the ones that we've tried to convert from the paper bit days, um, expect a certain uh, data set. So we, my, my off seat of, seat of my pants example earlier was the patient who gets the uh, aspirin or doesn't get the aspirin in the emergency department. Um, and so there's a question, did the patient get the aspirin? And oh, by the way, are there reasons that the patient shouldn't have had the aspirin? And when we search through the paper record, we can probably find whether they got it and, and or if there were examples of why they shouldn't have had it. Now the EHR is, it has certain data in it, right? The EHR may have the fact that the patient got it, but if the patient didn't get it, it may not have the answer why. Um, and one of the ways that we can start to fill that gap is to change where we are with respect to the, the availability of this information. So on the left, we can modify our expectations of the data. And so one ex for, for in our example here, we could say, well, maybe we should just expect that the patient got it or didn't get it, but let's not look for exceptions, right? Let's say we expect that 87% is an A, and we don't care about the exceptions. That's different from the way that quality measures have historically worked because these doctors, they want to get A's, right? And so they want to say, I want, I, score me on that one except for these you know, 19 scenarios in which I shouldn't have da had to do that. And what they're not thinking is, well, then they're going to have to record the data about all of the 19 reasons why the patient didn't get the statin or didn't get the blood pressure medication or didn't get the mammogram. Um, 
So when we stop thinking about the expectations, we can actually change our expectation of it, about the data. But also, we can expand the EHR uh, capabilities. So if a certain data element is essential, we can work with the health IT vendors, or we can be the government and say, well, you must. And so for stage two of meaningful use, we said, you must collect these 816 data elements. No kidding, there were 816. So we said, but, but 816, you have to catch these. Anything else doesn't need to be done. Um, and so this is stage one of meaningful use. The measure developers could use any words they wanted to use and expect any data because they were used to the, the paper world. And so the paper world said, hmm, go looking. Just go look for your information and we'll use lots of words to describe the things that we would expect. So ejection fraction is an interesting one. Or presence of right bundle branch block. Well, in the, in the analog world, that's easy to find, right? I just look around and find the echo report and it's narrative and I find, oh, the echo says it's 35% and that, that data gatherer, the, the abstractor, can find that information. EKG. There it is, it's the right bundle branch block on the EKG and I can see it and it says RBBB and I translate that analog information into data. And so it was easy for measure developers to say things like that. Um, what we did in stage two was we said you got eight crayons or in that scenario it was 816 crayons um, instead of the you know, uh, infinite number and this constrained the measure developers and they got a little bit annoyed with us. Um, this is a paper record, and this is the constraint of a paper record, right? And so the constraints of a paper record give us the opportunity to describe anything that we want. And now here's the usability paradox. This is the constraint of a digital record, and I, you know, I'm mocking myself again. But when we create digital records and we anticipate or we try, pretend to anticipate all of the needs of the clinicians, we make mistakes. We hardwire the system. We think that we've anticipated all the questions that can be asked, and the answer is we really haven't. We can't. Um, and so when we do this, we destroy the usability of the products. We destroy the workflow of the clinicians. Um, we create challenges. And now we're back to this, right? It's functional, it's reliable, but it's not usable. It's hard to use. Um, it's a pain in the butt. And so there's our picture of hardwiring, right? We actually hardwire in the questions. The docs have to navigate through various screens to capture the information that they were intended to capture. It's crazy. And so I would argue we need to shift to, to standards. And it's not standards of lots and lots of pieces that are all already baked together, but it's standards of data, standards of tiny bits of data that we can put together uh, to, to maintain the nuances that we need to maintain. Um, and so there's another standard, right? That's a United States standard. Um, our standards guy, Doug Fridzma, went to China recently and he came back, I, I don't have a picture yet, and he came back and he showed me, John, you've been to China. Um, the plugs actually accept the US plugs and the European plugs and the Aussie plugs. Um, they're, they're interoperable um, in China. Um, and so here's an interoperable thing, and this is kind of what I'm arguing we need to get to in health IT. Um, there are lots of little pieces, and it's a finite number of little pieces, right? So you can build incredibly creative things using Legos, just like you can build incredibly creative things so long as you use standardized data input. And I'll give you an example of non-standardized data input. Susan mentioned interoperability earlier. Um, we have challenges with interoperability because at the granular level, we haven't yet been explicit about how we want information to be captured. And so blood pressure. We allow blood pressure to be captured as systolic colon 120, uh, diastolic colon 87, as a text string, as a LOINC code. Um, there are lots of different ways we allow for blood pressure to be captured, which means that its semantic value is variable, right? We don't necessarily know what it is if it's captured as free text. 
So I would argue that if we, if we settle on a, a core subset, and maybe it's as a, a small number like, oh, I don't know, 816, um, small number of data elements that are explicitly captured uh, in a standardized way using standardized codes, then we can start to, to, to grow the uh, complexity of the systems, um, but only then. Um, if you've been to a toy store lately or you know young people, uh, you know that they still enjoy Legos, but what's happened in the past couple of decade is, decades is fascinating. They're hardwired, right? So here's an example of a Lego set. It's hardwired. You can't make you know, a picture of Curious George or a creation of a you know, power monster or whatever um, with one of these. You can only make Jurassic Park. So it's like the form that was developed for the gastroenterologist and now the GI surgeon's trying to use it. It doesn't work. You can't do it. Um, this guy is surprised about that. <laughs> so I would argue that the, the document-centric EHR, which hasn't yet let go of the metaphor of paper, is what's holding us back. And it's holding back the health IT developers. It's actually holding back the providers. Um, as I talk with the health IT developers and they say, hey, why haven't you let go of this model? Why are your docs creating notes? Well, I think there are two reasons. One reason is that notes are still the way we, we document so that we can derive payment from the encounter. Um, I think the payment uh, industry, ours included, uh, CMS, um, but also private payers, could start to think about the, the experience that a patient has as a continuum of observations rather than as an event for which they are, they are paying. Um, and that will get us away from the document-centric metaphor um, to a series of observations that occur. And when those observations occur, we can batch them temporally. And we might batch them temporally in, this, in the context of a visit. Or we might look at them orthogonally. We might want to look at all of a patient's blood pressures over, over time, or all of a patient's cardiac exams over time. We can't do that in a document model, nor could it be done with paper. But we're not constrained by paper anymore, right? Um, so we don't need to think about a document. And so a problem list might be part of the, the data set. Our Fitbit data, which I drew over here, um, reminding us that data comes from lots and lots of places. And maybe the owner of this information should be the patient and not the provider. Um, why documents? Because we like what we know, right? So here's McDonald's in Japan because people who go to Japan from the United States always flock here, right? They don't, they don't go to places they're unfamiliar with. Um, and so it, we, are, we are also creatures of habit and we need to get away from that. Um, what matters in the space of quality and to whom? I think we talked about this earlier and Micah's waving at me, so I'm gonna talk faster. Who's driving the bus? It needs to be us. And when I say us, it's not us, me wearing my government hat. It's us, the patients, us, the people, us, the consumers. This isn't about the government. This isn't about providers. And I remember when I, way back when I worked for a health IT vendor and our CEO got up and said, it's not about the hospitals, it's about the doctors. And after the talk, I went up to him and I said, dude, you got it wrong. It's not about the doctors, it's about the patients. This is for my friend Eric Schiffman, I, I mean Eric Dishman, sorry. Eric Dishman, and I'll, I'll, you can go Google him and, and read this, but I love the concept of the shift left. So as we shift left, quality goes up and costs goes down. And the shift left is the control is moving from tertiary care and the hospitals and the experts to primary care. And the control is moving from primary care and the doctor who went to medical school and were all smarty pants to the patient who cares more than the doctor about the patient's health. And the reason that the shift left is possible is because information can now flow. Because the primary care doctor has access to the evidence that 20 years ago was trapped between the ears of the specialist. And the patient has access to the information and the data that the primary care clinician has. And I mentioned earlier the 
you know, my, all of my high school classmates getting their colonoscopies. They know because that information is available there, and the information is available because of health information technology. So what I said, quality is important, usability is important, health IT has to change, and we have to change the focal point from data, um, from documents to data. And patients need to be in control, not providers. So that's it. Thanks for your time. Thank you.